Hey guys, I'm here with uh, Gary Mortimer talking uh, in preparation for the Workforce Success Conference coming from the 26th of July at the Hilton. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. Now, this is your second time around. You spoke yeah. at the, uh, the first conference last year about breaking the rules. So what do you actually mean by that? Well, yeah, it was, it was great to talk last year at the very first conference. And, and I guess my position there was um, we, we tend to set these very strict constraints around a customer service or customer engagement and sometimes it's okay to to give your your teams a little bit of flexibility or certainly empower them and this really came from I guess some of my interactions that I'd seen take place in a number of service sectors you know the one I talked about was was going into a bank a bank sure. I've been a, a member of for you know, I, I guess 25 years and asking for a very simple transaction we made to my my travel card and apparently there was a policy change and as a result of that the team member was unable to help me although they were able to help me ultimately uh, and it was a good example of we tend to make these policy changes without really thinking about what that does that mean for the customer and then we compared that with say flying with Qantas where I would observed a, a flight attendant break the rules or maybe let's just say bend the rules um, and give a, a customer that couldn't find their wallet a small bottle of wine. Sure. Yeah, so it was a really small incident, but what took place was the, the team member in the bank had a really negative experience and I had a really negative interaction because of a simple policy change. And they were very constrained. They couldn't, they couldn't bend the rules or be flexible. But the Qantas team member were able to bend the rules and they had a really positive interaction and it created a really positive, uh, I guess, experience for the, for the person that was flying at sure. the time. So really that's what we were talking about back then was bending the rules and, and, and what that means for your business. So you're saying there's a positive outcome by empowering employees to be able to break the rules? That's right, yeah. And I guess we also need to be mindful of that, that rules are necessary. If you're running a business, particularly if you're running a financial organisation or a, or a pharmacy or a retailer, yeah. you want to ensure that there are some rules in place. You want your customers to walk in and have a positive experience, but also a, a consistent experience across your different brands or your different businesses. So, so rules are important, but it's just exactly how far we take those rules and how much flexibility or empowerment we give our team. Uh, so we're not certainly suggesting we're going to upgrade people to first class or give them free flights, but we really need to look at, well, you know, what can we do to help the customer and, and do we always have to stick to these very, very constrained rules? Sure. What would be the kind of, I guess, the leniency you know, you'd recommend looking at that? Because obviously, as you said, you can't, you can't go too far, but you go too little. There's no real positive outcomes. How would a, a company really try and find the optimal kind of leniency there? Yeah, so I guess if we think about a hotel, for example, and there's lots of, uh, I guess, um, uh, team members in a number of different service uh, locations within a hotel situation. They may work in housekeeping, they may be in luggage or bellboy, uh, they may work in the cafe or in the restaurant. If a GM of a hotel gave every team member $20 a week as in uh, capital that they could use to solve the customer's problem, that could fix a lot of issues before they get sort of set up through social media or directly to admin or to, or to management. So classic examples are, um, you know, you've turned up in your room and maybe you're not happy with the way it's decorated, maybe you can't turn the TV on, uh, so you simply ask that the person that's walking down the corridor, can you assist me? And they go, yep, we'll get somebody for you. And listen, here's a voucher to go get yourself a cup of coffee uh, later this morning at the cafe downstairs sure. for $4. Yeah. Um, so giving them that, uh, I guess, that, or empowering them to be able to make those decisions without running around looking for a manager just to sign off that decision. Would you say it empowers employees more, engages them more in their work by having that ability to break the rules a little bit? Team members love the ability to be able to solve problems for customers yeah. without having to go and see a supervisor or a line manager. And supervisors and line managers are busy and they don't want to deal with the day-to-day -day mundane activities. We're talking about a free cup of coffee or you know, maybe moving someone to a different room that might have a better view without sort of upgrading them to a sort of presidential suite. Um, the team members really enjoy the ability to, to fix those problems and, and feel empowered. And what we find when we engage in that sort of uh, consumer oriented positive deviance, not negative deviance, but positive devi deviance, team members feel more empowered, they feel more satisfied with their job, they're willing to stay longer with an organisation that, that, that treats them well and empowers them to make the decisions, and they walk away at the end of the day having a really positive experience. We compare that to the bank example that we talked about last year, yeah. Um, that team member had a really negative interaction with me, they had a really negative interaction with the bank manager, their line manager, they didn't feel empowered to make a decision. Uh, and, and I can guarantee that you know, they'd be looking for another job you know, 
that afternoon sitting there on their on their phone. Yeah, sure. Would you say the the, the engagement creates is a from you know, the natural one of problem solving or even just them having a little bit of flexibility to be almost rebellious? What you say would have the, the biggest impact? I, I think it's not about being rebellious. I think um, team members will normally come to work, you know, to 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 to, uh, to create a, a deviant effect sure. in, the, in the marketplace or in their workplace. And certainly, we see levels of internal theft, and we see team members doing things that tend to be somewhat disruptive to an organisation or disruptive yeah. to an organisation. But they're generally dissatisfied team members. Uh, they're team members that possibly aren't performing well, or they feel disadvantaged in some way, and they might sort of you know, take company assets or damage company policy. But th these are a very minor group of uh, a minor group of, of, of team members. In most cases, what they want to do is actually so solve the problem for the customer. They want to solve the problem relatively quickly. And being empowered to make that decision, bend the rules, possibly break the rules a little bit, is a great way to, to look at business through just a different lens. So kind of making your employees more self-sufficient in their role. Yeah, and think about how much time it then saves lines of supervisors and managers you move up through that managerial chain. But suddenly you're not having to sort of um, you know, manage every single instance or interaction that takes place across a retail store, across a hotel chain, across a, a theme park. You can start to look more strategically at your business, knowing that your team are empowered to fix problems. Sure, it kind of reminds me of a, a quote that Steve Jobs has said and you know, implemented in, in Apple and <laughs> clearly worked it out fairly well. Although, what would you say the risks would be there? So obviously there'll be risk associated with any, anything you implement in a business, what would be the ones for here? Yeah, so, so clearly positives. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but there's always the risk that potentially people take it just a step too far. Um, and, and I guess it's a learning experience. So uh, in the case of the hotel manager that's empowered their team with a, a fictional or, or a hypothetical $20 a week that they can then yeah. give to customers who are not having a good experience, potentially someone's going to overspend that. Yeah, somebody's going to offer too many free cups of coffees, or maybe the free cup of coffee turns into free alcoholic drinks. Yeah, sure. At that point, at the end of the week, there's a bit of a debrief. Hey, these are the great things we did, but hey, here's some opportunities. And maybe let's have a look at what we're specifically offering. Um, you know, team members really don't want to get themselves into trouble. They don't want to come to work to get counselled or to get performance managed. And they don't want to walk away thinking, oh, I did a bad job. Uh, most people come to work wanting to do a good job, but people make mistakes. And I think that's probably the way I'd look at it. The risk is people may just go outside the, sure. I guess, the, the limit a little bit. At the end of the day, rather than sort of drag them into an office and counsel them, maybe just work with them to say this is a better way to uh, achieve that result. So I'm also self-educating, once again, to go back to make them more self-sufficient in that role. Exactly right, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Well, before we dive into what you're chatting about, uh, and then the conference coming up again, first I want to jump into a quick break. So we'll jump into that and then get right into uh, your topic for, for this year. Sounds great. Alright, let's get back into it. So this year, it seems you're talking about more a uh, point of difference with your title being uh, differentiate, not demonstrate. That's right. So what, yeah. What's your motivation there? Well, I, I guess I've been watching how businesses are responding to disruption and change in the marketplace. Sure. And I, I think we've certainly seen this disruption caused by Uber, we've seen disruption caused by Airbnb. I'm looking at businesses and how they're responding to this change. Um, if we go back a few years to when Uber entered the marketplace, I'm, I'm sure we'd all remember um, you know, taxis out there demonstrating, blockading airports in Melbourne, uh, standing in front of Parliament House, waving petitions. Um, and, and I think that's probably a negative way to approach change. Yeah. My view is that change is going to happen anyway. Disruption is going to sure. take place. Um, and businesses are going through that currently. And what happens after spending you know, 12, 18 months protesting and blockading? Um, customers went out. They want an alternative to catching a cab. Uh, the alternative was Uber. Uh, state governments finally said, well, we're going to legalise it. So all that effort and energy into demonstrating wasn't spent in looking at how do I differentiate my business or how do I change my business sure. model? How do I respond to this, this new competitor that's coming into the marketplace? How do I understand them and make sure that I'm somewhat different? There's something happened in, in Victoria only last month and I, I saw a small group 
of retailers headed up by the Master Grocers Association. These yeah. were the IGAs and the food works. And they're out there saying, save our stores. Yeah? Don't shop at, uh, at Coughland. Uh, you know, Coughland's going to be bad. Uh, we're going to uh, lobby council not to sign off uh, you know, their development applications. Now, now Coughland's owned by the Schwartz Group. It's the fourth largest retailer in the, in the world. It's, it also owns Lidl, which is the other Aldi alternative. Now, now that business has globally made a decision to enter the Australian marketplace. You can protest all you want, but they're coming. Um, it's a bit like protesting against Aldi. They're going to yeah. continue to grow. Uh, but, and, and consumers are, will make a choice to shop there, or they'll make a choice not to shop there. Yeah. Uh, so what happened last week, uh, the Victorian government signed off the application for three new Coughland stores in Victoria. They've signed one off in South Australia. They, they're looking currently at Queensland and also New South Wales. So this business will come to Australia and it will open businesses and stores at the end of this year at the start of 2020. Yeah. So protest all you want, it's probably better to spend some positive energy looking at how can I differentiate my business? How can I understand my customers more? Sure, so like the classic adapt or die situation, really. Exactly right. And I look at sort of taxis, and I was in one recently, and it's only now that we're seeing taxis implement apps on their phones so you can track where your taxi is. Um, they're starting to become more vocal on social media, but they're still not there yet. And, and I had a, a, a negative experience in a cab recently, and I tweeted my experience uh, because I had a Twitter account, yeah. and I got no response. So they set up a Twitter account because that's what I guess they have to do, but no one's running it, no one's having a conversation. So it's a slow burn for the taxi industry, they're slowly changing, and I think we're gonna see that with retailers and other businesses, how they respond to change and disruption. Yeah, sure, so retailers, obviously a prime example, there would be e-commerce coming into the market, and you've got you know, your, your physical location, it's not really adapting to that. What would you say uh, you know, retail would have in their toolbox to help them adapt uh, before it's too late? Well, I, I guess I look at really innovative retailers that are playing in the same space as others, but they're doing it somewhat differently. And yeah. uh, one, of the, one of the retailers I often look at is Lululemon. Now, Lululemon sells out leisure wear, they sell yoga pants and jogging gear. And, and that, those products aren't cheap. Um, but you can get those products anywhere else. You can get them at Lorna Jane, you can yeah. get them at Target, you can get them at Rebel Sport. So why is Lululemon different? What they're doing is they're building community around the brand. They understand they can't compete on price. They can't compete against Kmart and Target's $12 yoga pants because they sell $80 yoga pants. So what they do is they say, well, listen, um, our customers love yoga. That's yeah. why they come to us. So let's open our store up after close of business and do free yoga classes once a week. Yeah. Let's build some community around the brand. Um, we know that our customers really love jogging and running. That's why they come to buy jogging gear and running gear from us. Let's do jogging clubs or jogging classes at the start of you know, the start of the week. So again, let's build community around the brand, not compete on price. I look at super cheap auto, for example. So you know you can buy automotive parts online. If you know the part you're looking for, you don't necessarily go into the store and pick it up and feel it and touch it. Um, so what super cheap auto are doing at Penrith? They've opened a customer experience centre. Sure. They have a coffee area. You can go in and talk to other customers that are maybe you know, developing their cars or adding accessories to their cars. There's a storyboard that's happening there. As you walk through the store, if you're thinking about maybe fixing a panel on your car, you go to the spray area, you watch a video clip about how to do it. Um, if you're looking at, say, uh, radiator hoses, big sea of radiator hoses, you put in your model number and up it pops over here. So they're, they're blending their, their digital uh, footprint with their, their physical footprint to differentiate themselves from other automotive parts retailers, but also importantly, the growth of online in that space. So you kind of get the best of both worlds rather than one or the other? I think, yeah, exactly right. And I think what we're going to see, particularly in the retail space, is that blending of yeah. physical and digital. And it has to be that way because everybody's sort of playing in that digital space now. And more and more of us are now shopping online. We've seen this week uh, Bunnings announce a sort of a move on to, you know, into an online area. But they're doing it very strategically and very slowly as they're making sure they've got a really good offer to go online with before they sort of roll out across their entire fleet of stores. I mean, the, the challenge for retailers in this online space currently, particularly in food retailing, is how do I um, you know, get my product to my market faster? Uh, you know, and currently what we're doing is we're taking the product from a pallet and placing it on a shelf, waiting for an online order to come in, then taking yeah. it off the shelf and sending it back out to the customer's house. That's operationally slow, it's very, very costly. 
but we're, we're now looking at you know, how are retailers responding to that in a different way. So this week, Coles have announced sort of expanding a trial for Uber Eats. So a small range of products that you can jump on your phone, order, and it's delivered in 30 minutes. So speed is becoming yeah. the currency of new businesses. Yeah, well I guess you know, nowadays you get everything in real time, so it only makes sense to speed up those processes there. Yeah. How would you say the, the consumer experience would be really alterating the, uh, you know, the to differentiate rather than demonstrate it? So how would a consumer be impacting that? Well, one of the things we, we tend to want to look at is the, is the customer journey and, sure. and look for those pain points in that customer journey. So you know, we talked about sort of online shopping, for example. Um, you know, the, the process of finding the app on my phone is pretty easy. The process of, of, of ordering is pretty easy. Uh, and transacting is secure, that's, that's good, but the pain point is waiting. Yeah. So how do I fix that? Now I can't afford to have trucks running around the suburb with a couple of items on it. So what we're seeing is sort of really innovative startup companies jumping into this space going, I can fix that pain point. Yeah. Companies like Parcel, so Parcel's almost like the Uber of, of home deliveries. So they're, they're tapping into the gig economy. So people work in the city and they go home to the suburbs. So you know, a Parcel, um, uh, rider or driver will say, listen, I'm heading home to my suburb and there's a couple of things I can take home. I can stop it at Meyer and Coles and David Jones on the way home and I can drop them in my suburb. So we're, we're finding people are jumping onto these little sort of gig economies and, and fixing a pain point for, for consumers. Sure, so as innovation enters something like the retail space, obviously a lot of retailers are currently dropping off. I guess where would you see the industry in the space looking in say three to five years? Yeah, I, I think there's areas where we're going to start to see some what I refer to as rationalisation of the yeah. marketplace. We're seeing that play out pretty clearly in apparel retailing. Uh, and again, that's because you know we've got apparel retailers that aren't differentiated. They're trying to compete on price and they're trying to be the same. So longevity in the marketplace is no saviour for your business. Um, if we look at Roger David in the marketplace for 76 years and they, they closed up this just before Christmas. Uh, Ed Harry just went into voluntary administration, they can't find a buyer, they're going to close their stores, another 500 staff out of date, uh, out of work. Now, if we look at that menswear apparel retailing space, we could sort of put it into that mix. Uh, Ed Harry, Connor, Y&D, Tara Cash, they're all menswear retailers, they're all selling shirts for $29, yeah. and they're all produced in Pakistan and Bangladesh. There's no point of difference between any of those retailers, which means Customers have got a choice, and they're going to go to the one with the cheapest prices, unless you can be different. Um, so I think apparel, we're going to see some rationalisation. We look at the big W division that you know, the Macquarie have looked at that and said, so potentially they're going to have to right size their fleet. There's 183 stores; they've probably got 60 stores too many, 60 stores that are making yeah. a loss. So ultimately, the smart move would be to get rid of those 60 stores pretty quickly over the next couple of years, and suddenly you've got a more profitable business. Yeah, so it seems like there's, I guess, a lot of questions that need answers in, in that space, and I'm sure you'll have the, the answers uh, at the conference. So uh, we'll wrap it up here, but I just want to quickly say, in relation to the conference, it's on the 26th of July at the Hilton. So tickets are actually selling out pretty fast. We're hoping for five, 600 people. So buy your tickets fast. We've got a lot of good speakers uh, in the line with a lot of other, other videos like this will be out of, of interviews. So make sure to watch the videos and also come on to the conference. Keen to see you all, and I really appreciate your time.